the dark side of sobriety. Let's talk about it. You know, you probably heard this a million times. People are saying to people that are addicted, hey, look, you just get sober and your life is going to change. Everything is going to be amazing. You're going to have your family. Uh, you, people are going to, everybody's going to forgive you. Uh, you're going to have this great, and you as a part, so two, two sides, right? The addict or alcoholic is thinking magically, oh my God, all I have to do is get sober and my life's going to be so great. And then the family member is thinking to themselves, all they have to do is get sober and my life's going to be great. So either way, everybody's thinking sobriety is the ticket. But I have to tell you something, psych, that's like a big psych. I mean, I, I, I hate to break the news, but maybe you're like, you're not breaking the news, you're spilling the beans. Okay, great. I'm going to spill the beans today. I'm going to talk about the things that nobody talks about, which is how things, when somebody gets sober, actually get worse for many, many people. And they get worse um, before they get better or they get worse and they never get better. So why am I going to deliver all, why am I the bad news bear today? Why am I going to be focusing on this? Because here's what I believe to be true. It's like that little rainbow. I don't know if you're you're a kid from you know the 80s or you're younger, but back in my day, back in my day, we'd have you know this this these uh, after school specials. Okay, it used to scare the shit out of you. Some of these after school specials would tackle these topics that were like, oh my god, I can't believe. Nowadays, I think to myself, I cannot believe this was an after school special that people talked about these hard subjects. But lately in our kind of sugar-coated candy festival land that we live in, uh, everybody wants to put filter on things, pretend everything's better than it is, and nobody wants to hear the bad news. And I get that. But my philosophy on this is, if you can understand that this actually happens, then when it happens to you, you're not going to feel like, what the fuck is wrong with me? Okay. Isn't that comforting to know that it's not just you that's having this problem, that a lot of people are having this problem? I know for all the time I've been doing this, that's one of the, the most important things people say to me is, oh my God, I thought I was the only one. Thank God other people are experiencing this. Other people are going through this. I'm not the problem here. It's not just me. So I want to kind of like give this, uh, there was also this reading rainbow, right? This rainbow would come across the more, you know, with a star that would like shoot across someday guys, we're going to have a budget around here and we're going to have like effects. And I'm actually going to edit these, these videos and put like, a, I mean, it's going to be right someday, maybe, <laughs> maybe, maybe not. In any case, I want to get into these with you today. I started to prepare and take some notes because I want to see if you can see yourself in any one of these. And by the way, speaking of a budget, uh, these videos are sponsored by yours truly through the work that we do at HeidiRain.com. If you are curious or interested about one of our uh, uh, courses that we have to support you, we have a family program that's absolutely phenomenal. It answers every question you would ever have about how to deal with addiction in your family dynamic. The whole family can participate and watch. One person purchases the course. Everybody can go through it together as a family. It's enlightening. It comes from a personal development perspective. My husband and I, my husband was working with Tony Robbins at the time, and we got recruited to teach these philosophies of personal development inside of a drug and alcohol treatment center where we did that for about eight years. My husband and I worked alongside of each other. We had created a family program there and helped hundreds of families and thousands of addicts and alcoholics recover their lives and live the lives that they wanted to be awake for. Amen. And so I just want to encourage you, we filmed that whole entire process plus hours and hours of bonus coaching uh, content and Q&A calls with our beloved family members who would go through and have probably the same questions you have. So you can get that over at HeidiRain.com. And every time you purchase a course, it helps us to be able to keep doing what we're doing and help more people. So thank you for your support. And okay, let's get into it. <clears throat> what are some of the things that we think are going to be solved by sobriety? And then we, they get sober and we go, oh my God, this is worse. Or sometimes a brand new problem crops up. Well, one of the most common things that people think is going to change or get fixed when somebody gets sober is this intimacy issue. You know, you, it's very obvious why 
you would have intimacy issues with an addict or an alcoholic. You can't be intimate with somebody who's not home, nor do you want to. Can't tell you how many times I've had conversations with women that feel coerced or you know, talked into or blamed or shamed or guilted, or even men too, that, that give in and have sex, uh, you know, with somebody, whether under the influence or just succumb to the pressure or whatever it is. And they're constantly in the state of self-betrayal and they're not attracted to their partner. And who would be, who would be attracted to somebody that's checked out? I mean, unless you're a sadist, right? Why, that's no, there's nothing attractive about being intimate with somebody who has no access to intimacy at all whatsoever. So it's a no brainer that when they're under the influence, you'd be like, no, gross, get away from me. But when they get sober, we're like, oh my God, that's going to change. That'll come back. The problem is for a lot of people who use drugs and alcohol, they are medicating. And, and by the way, this video is for everybody. So if you are in recovery, please feel free to watch this with your spouse. This video is for couples, individuals, singles, people in recovery, people thinking about recovery, people that have people in recovery or want to be sober. This is for everybody. So please watch it together so you can be like arming each other and going, yeah, no kidding. Don't you feel this way too? I see this. I see this. Now, if somebody's in active addiction, nobody's home anyway. So you can show them this video, but they'll forget about it tomorrow or, you know, they're not even home now. So if somebody's on the path to recovery, of course, you can share this information with them. That's a better thing to do. So let's, let me, let me tell you what happens when people get sober. Many times when people are, what you discover is when people get sober, that we put all this pressure thinking drugs and alcohol were the main problem. Well, that's the problem we have these, that's why we have these intimacy issues because you're drunk and you're out to lunch and I'm not attracted to you. And that's why as soon as you get sober, everything's going to be great. Well, a lot of the times people drink and use drugs because the intimacy was the issue to begin with. All right, let's let that like marinate, sit down in our tummies, go down deep and get a hold of that one. Okay. People use drugs and alcohol for a good reason. Now, if somebody's early in recovery and you're like, why were you using drugs and alcohol? And he said that there's a deep seated reason why you're using. And they're like, I don't know. I just like to get high. I just like the taste of beer. Bullshit. No, you don't. Okay. Nobody just likes to do anything. There's a th problem that it's solving. Okay. I like to eat French fries, but I'm not like clawing my way through and knocking people out and robbing and knocking off stores so I can like steal French fries from McDonald's. Okay. Like I'm not obsessed with French. So it's just like, I like it. Okay. When it reaches that compulsive stage, it, it starts by meeting a need. And for many people that need that alcohol or drugs meet is I do not without alcohol or drugs know how to be seen felt, discovered with or be with another human being, let alone myself authentically. So now what we've done is we've taken off the drugs or alcohol and we think the intimacy is going to be restored. And all of a sudden they are awkward as hell or you're awkward as hell, or it's you're like, how do we ever do this in the first place? You're like, this is horrible. Or uh, there's no trust. So there's still no desire to have sex. So the person who gets out of, and, and this is what happens a lot, that the alcoholic or the sober person now that went to treatment or went and got better, when they're in treatment, you know, there's bits of truth, right? To how this relationship is duly fucked up. I mean, let's just be real, right? It, it is, it's duly fucked up. We want to say that all of their, all of our problems in the relationships are because of their drinking or using, but it's also our participation and that issue, how we go up in it, what we do to navigate it, which also becomes the issue. So they might say to you, well, before one of the reasons I drank so much, which is not true. Well, what they'll say is one of the reasons I drank so much is because you wouldn't be intimate with me, right? Because you're frigid, you're cold. We have all these intimacy issues and you say rightfully so, well, I have these intimacy issues because you're an alcoholic. So now it's like the chicken or the egg here, right? The truth is you both have intimacy issues. Now I know that's going to be hard to hear, but the truth is when you're with a partner who cannot be intimate with you because they're kind of checked out, you also chose that person for a reason because of your own intimacy issues. So now you're both like sober, naked, metaphorically and physically, 
emotionally, psychologically, and it could be very uncomfortable for both of you. And then that person says, well, I got sober and then you still won't have sex with me. What's the point of this? Why did I even get sober? You still don't want to be intimate with me. Well, the truth is fostering intimacy is a journey. Many times when I work with couples, I say, okay, we're, intimacy needs to be restored. That's been damaged in this dynamic, you know? Okay. And the dark side of sobriety is, well, now we're, we're sober, but there's still no intimacy. There's nothing happening here. What's going on? And I say, well, define intimacy. And they say, well, I want to have sex. Well, okay, well, sex is not necessarily intimacy. It's a form of being intimate with somebody, but it's certainly not intimacy. Intimacy, remember that old <laughs> stupid movie about a guru that was like, a, you know, the guy from Saturday Night Live did this guru thing. And he was like, uh, he does all the characters. He did Shrek's voice. And he did this, this uh, movie about intimacy. And he would go around saying, intimacy into me, I see. And it was like the, meant to be the cheesiest thing in the world, into me, I see. And it was the cheesiest thing in the world, but also probably the, one of the most accurate things. But intimacy really is into me, I see. And I let you in on it. And so it's not just sex. It's not just the body. It's not just that. It's not access to that. Intimacy is, here's what I'm really thinking. Here's what I'm really feeling. Here's what's really going on with me. And when you are in an addicted, to toxic dynamic, or even you grew up that way, or you're, it's still that way, sharing truth is dangerous for you. You've learned how to keep it on lock. You've learned how to shut it down, withhold, keep your feelings to yourself, not share what you're thinking, uh, not from yourself even. Keeping your deepest desires hidden from yourself, your deepest fears hidden from yourself. And so sobriety is a process of not just unearthing that information for your partner, it's unearthing it for yourself so that you can share it. And so, so much of the couples work that I do is I will have a couple come into session and we just share, we share our intimate details of our lives, of things that have happened to us and what we made those things mean and how we've interpreted things. Not, it's, it's a very different approach to building intimacy and rebuilding trust in a couple. It's not just rehashing what happened and you're never going to do it again, or thank God, you know, well, I'm sober now. So every time you bring that up, you're triggering me and you know nobody goes anywhere. So the dark side of sobriety is intimacy and the road home, home to intimacy is a freaking long, windy road. Or another dark side of sobriety is somebody comes out of recovery. There was no intimacy at all before. Now they're sober. And now the new addiction is sex addiction. The new addiction is now we have to have sex all the time because if I don't have sex at least every day, I'm going to use drugs or alcohol. I mean, I know this sounds really crazy, but I know people that are this way. I've worked with people that have gotten out of treatment and said, well, I got to get my, now I have all this dopamine deficiency and your body and your whole is the receptacle. I need, I know this is so gross, but this is how it feels to another human being is that I just got out of recovery and I'm sober now and you're the receptacle that I'm going to hook into and get my happiness from. So if that means I'm going to do it when you're naked, I'm going to plug into you and have sex with you. I'm going to try to get a rise out of you. And people use other people as a way to get high in sobriety. So you have to also know when that's going on and be able to say, well, yeah, I, you know, I know I want to be intimate with them, but now they want it every day. And now you get into that trap. If I'm not intimate with them every day or loving them or telling them how great they are or stroking their ego or stroking other body parts, then now they're going to relapse. And all this fear comes in around managing how much intimacy you're outputting at the sake of another human being and at the sacrifice of yourself. And that is terribly unhealthy, terribly, terribly unhealthy. All right. So I think I've beaten that drum. Okay. Did I drive this point home to you? Intimacy is just one of the dark sides of sobriety. Another dark side of sobriety is repressed anger. Repressed anger. When somebody gets sober, they seem like when they're drunk or high, you might've seen bouts of anger. 
Uh, you might've even seen like things that seem like out of character for this person where they go off the handle, they fly off the rails, but then you attribute it to the alcohol or the drugs. And you're like, oh, they'd never be like that if it wasn't for drugs and alcohol. Right. So, you know, I think that anger is going to go away whenever they get sober because drugs are the problem. And this is what's creating this issue. Well, it's the chicken or the egg. People are medicating and using drugs and alcohol for a very good reason. One of those reasons that people use drugs and alcohol is to quiet the demon of rage. It's to stuff down and suppress the rage they feel inside. That's this never ending, never ending smoldering of disdain. Not necessarily for you, but for life, for everything that's happened to them over the course of their life for the trauma they've, they've enacted or the trauma they've been through, but there's a deep seated rage in most abused kids, by the way, is also this deep seated rage that gets covered up by a nice girl or a, you know, like the Stepford wife. And you could just see just underneath of that Stepford wife is like, e -e -e, right. The knife wants to come out and like stab the enemies. This is, true for anybody who has a significant amount of trauma in their lives that if you don't deal with being rightfully angry about the things that have happened to you in your life, then you repress them and they come out at these odd, weird times. And when you drink alcohol or do drugs, the gate is open. The, the guard is gone. The guard of the gate is gone and the anger comes out. So the, the drugs and alcohol aren't creating the rage, they're releasing it because the guards are gone, the brakes are off. And now this person can emote and let go because there's no filter stopping the show. So they get sober and all of a sudden you notice they're angrier a hell of a lot more. Little things set them off a hell of a lot more. This is to be expected. This is, this is to be expected. However, not to be tolerated or endured. And there's a big difference between those things. I expect you to be angry. You know, hey, Fred, you know, I know you got a lot of shit to be angry about. I get it. And I understand. However, you know, or which, however, I was told when I was a corporate trainer is a butt in a tuxedo, right? Like, you know, say, oh, I love you, but, you know, well, whatever happened before, but you don't remember, right? Or I love you. However, okay, same difference. So let's not do that. Let's say, you know, hey, I understand your rage is to be expected and it's important you have a proper vehicle to express it and I'm not the vehicle, okay? I'm not, I ain't the one, honey. You got the wrong one, all right? I'm not the one that wants to, that, so what happens is though that they do need to deal with it. And so maybe the, let's say, well, maybe they think they do have the right one. Well, you are the right one because you know what? And here's what's crazy. Sometimes you've been putting up with somebody's shit for decades, for a long time. You have been having an alcoholic as a partner or a child or a dad or a mom or whatever. And you have been so busy sweeping up messes, put, giving them cold compresses, bringing them their green smoothies, trying to make sure they're okay, you know, smoothing over more than just the smoothie, right? For them, putting up with, tolerating their behavior, making excuses to families and friends when they can't do stuff, you know, going to bat for them, being the only person that's like consistently there for them. And then they get sober and they have the goddamn audacity to get mad at you for all of that stuff. And they'll say things like, well, you enabled me. Yep. If you hadn't been enabling me, well, all those times when you should have held my feet to the fire and you didn't, and I was drunk. And instead of like getting me to rehab, you held my hair and helped me puke. I mean, this is the shit people have the nerve to say to you. And you're like, are you kidding me right now? Do you think I enjoyed pulling over and letting you puke and leaving the party early and covering up for you and carrying you out of that place? So nobody was, do you think I enjoyed all these things? You know, you're like, how could you possibly be mad at me for doing all that? It's crazy. But what you think people will get mad at you for, like they'll get mad at you if you hold their feet to the fire, if you send them into rehab, the addict gets mad at that. But the person that wants to be in a relationship with you adores you for it. They're like, thank God you did that. I can't tell you how many times I've heard cries of gratitude for being an asshole. Thank God you were so direct, Heidi. Thank God you pulled no punches. Thank God you didn't let co-sign my bullshit. Thank God you let you didn't let me get away with anything because now our family's better and restored and healthy and happy and whole. But what they will blame you for 
is being is signing up for the circus and participating in your role. You were the ringmaster and they were like the lion or the donkey or the jackass or whatever. There's going to come a day when they're going to be mad at you for that. And you're going to scratch your head and just be like, I can't even believe it. But it's important that you know that it's their right to be upset about people that have enabled them in their lifetime. It's their right to be upset about the people who like held the door open or went and bought the drugs with them. It's important that they get to that part of their recovery where they're like, you know what? That wasn't okay. We shouldn't have been doing that. In fact, that behavior that you enacted was toxic and dysfunctional. Enabling me was your flavor of toxicity. That was your damage. Okay. Like, remember what's your, what's your damage? Well, that was your day. That's your damage was helping them stay stuck and sick. And so there's going to be these moments where they start to get mad at you and start to see things that you're like, you got to be kidding me. You're, you're upset that they start getting angry about the way that you, you communicate. They say, well, you're, you're not open with your feelings and thoughts. You know, they get into recovery, they start sharing and they're like, well, you're, you're, you need to get into recovery. You know, you don't know how to talk or you don't know how to communicate. And you're like, are you kidding me? I've tried to communicate with you when you were drunk and you peed in your own pants for like 10 hours last, you know, Tuesday. Now you want to judge me for how I communicate with us. Like unfathomable to you that they would have this perspective, but they do. When they start to get well, they have anger as well. And they're allowed to have that anger. And so are you. So the other piece of this is the addict or alcoholic thinks that when they get like, hopefully if you're watching this as a couple, right? And the sober person's like pushing you right now. They're like, yeah, Pam, I'm going to be mad at you. See, well, now here it's your turn. Are you ready? And guess what? Your partner is very allowed to be fucking mad at you too. Okay. Because what happens is you go to treatment and you're like, thank God that's over. Oh my God. And you you feel it from the depths because you've been struggling with alcohol or addiction for decades, right? Long time. And you're like, thank God this is over. And it really is over for you. And you're happy to move on. And you just want to put it behind you. And the last thing you want to do is deal with all the shit that you did and all the things that happened and all the anger everybody feels. But you actually need to do that. You need to sit with your family when you're strong enough, after you've been through recovery long enough, you have your sea legs, right? You've handled life. How long is that? I don't know. Long enough where you feel like psychologically and emotionally, you can handle it. And by the way, you should be challenging yourself to handle things in recovery and having tough conversations and not people not afraid to have tough conversations with you because they're afraid they're going to trigger you and you're going to relapse. At some point, you need to be able to have these tough conversations and hear them and be a fucking adult, okay? You need, I, I get mad. Why did I get mad just now? I got mad because I started thinking about all the times that I've had clients that want to, children or spouses that want to talk about the pain that you've inflicted on them as an actor and alcoholic, okay? Now I'm speaking to the addict. And the actor alcoholic, guilts, shames, or blames the person that has the anger and say things like, well, you should get over it. That was yesterday. That ended last night. What the hell's the matter with you? If you keep bringing this stuff up again, you're going to make me relapse. Or they go super victim. If super victim, they start crying and full of shame. And they're like, I know I'm so sorry. I shouldn't have done that. They can't handle it when you confront them. They, they, they crumble in shame. And then you feel bad for confronting them. So you stop your work because you need to now protect their feelings. That is a giant crock of shit. There has to be some point in your recovery journey where you're fucking able to have somebody come at you and go, you fucked up. And that you're strong enough to go, I did. Tell me how I hurt you. Not I did, and I never would have done that if I wasn't drunk. And I'm, you know, it'll never happen again. If you keep talking about it, you're going to make me, you're going to trigger me up. No, you look at the human being and you go, I did hurt you. Let me hear it. Not because you're a sadist and you want to be like, oh, just tell me how I hurt you, but because you have the space within you and the desire and the willingness to hear somebody's pain and hold it. The addict alcoholic has inflicted so much freaking pain on the family, surely. You can take five minutes and listen to somebody else's pain they've in, you've inflicted on them, okay? Surely, even if you didn't mean to do it. And that's the worst defense in the world. I didn't mean to do it. Well, I, I don't care if you meant to do it. I don't care if I go down the road and somebody hits me and runs me over with a car and they were on their phone, they didn't mean to do it. 
I'm still fucking dead. I'm still injured. I'm still legless. I'm still, you know, trying to get up and, you know, I mean, come on. Okay. I'm getting hot. See, I start talking about this stuff. I start to get hot. My sweat, my shirt, it's, it's getting hot in here. It's getting hot in here. I'm not going to take off my clothes. Although my videos might get more views, huh? Maybe that's a strategy. We start doing like bras with, you know, you know, little bikinis and stuff. I don't know. No, people would probably just be like commenting weight loss tips. Okay. Anyway, let's move on. So what do you do about this anger issues? We're not going to move on. Apparently what I'm going to encourage you to do is get with somebody who can help you start to work through these anger issues, just like the intimacy stuff is going to take time. So is the anger. You need to have a third party, a safe container. I facilitate this all the time where couples come in and we are the containers for one another. And it's magical moments. When I see couples exchanging and listening and holding the pain on both ends, because there is both ends and we don't do it the same day, right? When's it my turn? You know what I mean? We, don't, we do it in different sessions. So we have time to digest, time to marinate, time to discuss, time to let it simmer. I mean, the work that I get to do with couples when I see them who are willing to do this work and they get to the other side of sobriety together and they are soulmates. And so happy and so elated that they stuck it out because now they're like war buddies. And do you know the connection between war buddies? It's unbreakable when you've been through something as a couple like this together, but it only works when both parties are willing to do that level of deep dive, when they're both willing. Now, if you might be saying, wow, this sounds so great, Heidi, I would love my partner to be able to do this work. The only caveat is that they're already sober. Okay. So I'm not, I'm not going to meet with your recovering drunk person and try to talk sense into that person. That's, that's a waste of your money and it's a waste of your time. But if somebody is sober and beginning their recovery journey and now they're in, they're in recovery, they've gone to detox, they've gone to treatment and now they're ready to recover. That's when we can work this family program together. That's when we can come together as a family and start to repair the damage as a team. And this is so important because your loved one is not aware, the alcoholic or addict isn't even aware of all the damage that's been done to the children, to you, to parents, to siblings, to everybody. And so it's really important we have a very safe space to be able to talk about this, walk through it as a, as a team and come out of it the other side. If you're interested in that, to see if that's something that would even work for your family, go over to HeidiRain.com and schedule a 90 minute strategic consultation with me. And I know I'm, I'm booked up. I know I'm busy, but please, if you don't see a time and it's an emergency, set you as a place, just email me on the bottom of my site at HeidiRain.com. You can email me and just say, Hey, I really need an emergency appointment. Is there something we can do? And we can always try to work something out. Okay. All right. So another thing, I mean, I've talked about so much today. Where else, what else do I want to talk about? Emotion. You might think that, you know, for people's, em and this is anger, this goes in with anger, but just the emotional outbursts in general can tend to get worse. So it's not just anger. It's also you think, well, you're so sad and depressed because you're drunk. You're so sad and depressed because you're high. You're so sad and depressed because you're this or that, or you're, you know, you're unmotivated because you smoke weed all day long, or you, you know, whatever it is that you're thinking that somebody is doing. Alcohol and drugs solve an underlying problem. So let's say that somebody has a lack of motivation. That's their underlying issue. I had a, somebody, one time I was counseling this uh, father and father and son. And he said, you know, I can't wait till he gets sober because he has no motivation. He is so lazy. All he does is smoke weed all day. He's in his bedroom. He doesn't want to do it. You know, first of all, dad, why are you? Why is the kid in your bedroom, your family home smoking weed all day? We've got some work to do. Okay. But I digress. We were able to help that family and get them back on track. But what I want to say is he had this idea in his mind. He said, well, I can't wait till he gets sober because this, this father happened to be a really hard worker. He had built a company from scratch, from nothing, and was just an ass kicker, you know, just an ass kicker. And he wanted his son to work in the family business. And he wanted his son to take it over, but his son is like high all the time and not able to, you know, is like checked out. So his dad was just like waiting for this moment when he'd have his son be able to take things over. And, you know, 
I warned them. I, I said, I, you know, you guys, I don't have this crystal ball around. I try to warn everybody. I carry it around. I'm like, guys, listen, I'm going to tell you, this is, this is what's going to happen. And it's still hard sometimes when it does. But what happened was he got sober and he was still lazy as hell. And the reason that he was smoking so much is because he wanted to shut up his dad, who was always pressuring him to be in the family business. And he didn't want to be in the family business, but he didn't know how to say that. He didn't know how to say, dad, I want to do my own thing. I want to do something different. He had his own issues, right? He felt all this pressure. And instead of dealing with the pressure or talking about it with his dad, he just got high and shut his dad up. So his dad would now focus on him being high instead of him working on the business. But you see all these issues, the dark side of sobriety is when people get sober, the issues appear. They come to light. It's a dark side. The addiction is a darkness. And when it comes out, that dark side gets exposed to the light. And we start to see all these things. So you might notice somebody is quieter even. They're more introverted. And all of a sudden, when they were drinking, it's like, you know, you have your husband and he's an alcoholic and you take him to the party and he is the freaking life of the party. You know, he goes there, he has a couple of drinks, but you know, and that's not so bad. That's a nice part. You like that part because maybe you're a little introverted, but then all of a sudden he hits that mark where it's like, oh shit, shit's going to hit the fan. And he, he makes an ass of himself. He embarrasses you. He embarrasses himself. He embarrasses whatever. And then he leaves. And then you're like, well, if he quits drinking, he'll still be that life of the party. He just won't cross the line and be a weirdo, a freak, an asshole, right? You're just like, but lo and behold, he gets sober and he's a freaking introvert. And you're like, who did I marry? It's like that. Wasn't there a TikTok series where somebody did, who did I marry? I could, I can't watch stuff that takes five hours to, well, 18 hours. Just tell me the thing. I mean, this video is long. And I'm taking a lot of time, but I'm just telling you thing after thing after thing, right? I don't have time to like let things unfold. I want to know the stuff. So what I'm telling you is they're going to get sober and they're they're going to probably be a different person in many ways than you. And you're going to have to get to know them and getting to know them is going to be weird. Another dark side of sobriety is you get to know them and all of a sudden they don't want to spend time with you. They want to go to more meetings. They want to spend more time with their new friends they met at, at, at coffee and like that's their new bff and they're talking to their sponsor every day and they're not talking to you and they're telling their deep dark secrets to all these people around them and they're doing all this hard work and everybody at church like loves them but you know nothing about what's going on with them and they're not sharing anything with you and you're like get resentful oh you're gonna another meeting didn't you just go to one yesterday or they're going to two meetings or three meetings a day and you're like jesus now they're addicted to this it's hard for you as a spouse to watch somebody start to pull away from you as they're in recovery, because when you, when they're active in addiction, it's just this little bubble between you and your family and all the focus and attention goes on this person. All of a sudden, when they get start to get better, they need a support group beyond you. You shouldn't be their primary source of support. They should have a therapist, a support group, a mentor, a coach, a sponsor, a, you know, just whatever. Their whole team of people, psychiatrists, psychologists, all these people around them to help them. And it can be hard for you as a spouse to like let that process happen because it can feel selfish of them almost. Like how dare they now devote all this time to their recovery when they stole so much time from me in their addiction, but it is necessary. And if you can allow them to have these relationships, what you'll find is you start to develop relationships outside of your obsession with their addiction too. And isn't that a wonderful thing? Isn't that what you wanna be doing? is while they're having their recovery team of people around them that they're talking to and they're sharing their stuff that you are now starting to rely on your friendships more, maybe your coach, your therapist, your person, you know, whoever it is, uh, myself included, that you start to share and to have these deep, and now all of a sudden you're like, oh, I don't have to worry about their drinking because they have a sponsor. Would I like to take a dance class? Would I like to go to art school? Would I like to knit. I don't fucking know what I'd want to garden something for me. It's an obsession with the woods. I, I I don't know what it is. I need to move to the woods now. I need to be in the woods and explore and go hiking. I mean, that's, you know, there's so much more, many more fascinating things than what to wonder about in life than is he drunk. There's so many more fascinating things in life to wonder about than that. So resentment, emotion, intimacy, social issues, all these things. 
one of the things uh, that's really hard is switching addictions. I want to make sure that there's two things that I don't forget here. Okay. Two things, three things that I don't forget. Um, that they, they switch addictions. So even though treatment can seem like the new addiction, that's a normal thing. And I think that it's designed that way because think about how much time somebody's spent obsessing about drugs or alcohol or getting high or their whole life is revolving around these things, okay? Uh, they need to get that involved with something else. And sometimes the new addiction is a healthier one like recovery, <laughs> Uh, running, exercising, eating right, getting on a health kick, you know, all these things are wonderful. And sometimes it's not a healthy obsession. It can turn to sex or food or gambling or pornography or, or love or any other things. And so you have to be really careful that you think, well, you know, thank God they went to treatment for uh, opiates, you know, and hey, thank God that's over because now they don't, but now you're noticing they're drinking and they're like, well, opiates wasn't my, you know, drinking wasn't my problem. Opiates was my problem. So I'm never going to stop drinking. You know, I can drink, but the truth is alcohol and drugs are a way to numb and medicate when they're not used therapeutically. Okay. And I do want you to know that I do think in certain circumstances, there is a call or a necessity for some kind of plant medicine, I think can be very helpful for some people. I think that there are, I'm not trying to throw the baby out with the bathwater and say like, not, no intervention is good, no medication. No, obviously all medication has a place. All medication has a purpose when it's being used properly and not just as a way to check out, but as a way to manage and mitigate, okay? Uh, somebody's internal psychological challenges. So- when somebody switches addictions and now they're drinking, that is not a form of medicine that would be a good way to manage that, right? Uh, it's just using another substance to numb instead of actually pursuing a part of recovery that would be more helpful, okay? So switching addictions is something very, very normal. When I was in the weight loss industry, uh, I first started many, many years ago. I helped build up a company in the weight loss business called LA Weight Loss. And we, I was a, a corporate person in that world and training and development and, you know, strategic stuff. And uh, I helped a lot of people, I helped thousands and thousands of people. And the program was really good and lots of people lost weight. But the crazy thing was, is that after they lost all the weight, they became an alcoholic. So many people that I know who've had gastric bypass, or, you know, different kinds of uh, weight loss. They've had a radical, like something that prevented them from eating, like a radical shift has lost the weight, but then substituted with alcohol or started another behavior. So switching addictions is something very common and it is a problem. It's not, well, I don't have a problem with alcohol so I can drink. It's now I'm just using alcohol instead of heroin. Okay. So I want you to really pay attention to that. The other thing is when somebody is a child of an addict or an alcoholic, and this is a big one for even adult children or little kids, the parent is checked out. Let's say mom is off the rails and it's been up to dad. Okay, dad has been doing everything. You're super dad. You've been like managing the house, making the bacon, frying the bacon, eating, eating the bacon, cooking the bacon, all of the bacons, okay? And the mom is ill-equipped for life, right? She's overwhelmed all the time. And that's her main reason for using drugs and alcohol, right? She's an overwhelmed person. So as soon as the kids come home from school, she's disappeared. She goes up in her bedroom. She's MIA. She's using, she's getting high. She's drinking her wine. She's doing whatever. She's under the influence from the moment anything comes like parenting or something like that. And the kids are like crawling on her. She's passed out. They're trying, I mean, it can go from like I'm drunk in the kitchen preparing food and I have wine and I'm checked out and you know me, I'm a little weird all the way to I'm passed out on the couch and I'm unavailable. <clears throat> There's lots of shades in between that. But let's say that she gets sober and now all of a sudden she wants to be super mom and now she's sitting on the bed with her kids and the tweens and she's like, tell me all your life and tell me your problems and you should be telling me these things and what's going on with you and I want to be a parent now and where's your homework? And the kid is like, what the fuck? Yeah, even nine-year-olds will say that in their own heads who the hell do you think you are? What the fuck is this? That is what that nine-year-old is saying. And the, their things are saying this, if they could tell you, now you want to be a parent. Now you're concerned about my life. Now you want to know what's going on with me. Now all of a sudden you care. Now a couple of things are happening with that kid. Number one, they do not trust you at all. 
they think um, they're going to tell you all their secrets and you're going to be drunk on Saturday. They, they do not trust the process at all. They don't trust you. They don't trust the process. And you have to be aware that your kids are not just like waiting for you to now suddenly parent them. They have been the parent to you and they have been the parent to your spouse and they have been the one that's been like the surrogate husband, the surrogate wife, learned knowing all these problems. And all of a sudden now you want to come back in and have mommy and daddy time and you're the adults. And the child, I've seen this a million times. The parents are fighting. The tween comes in the room. Mom, dad, let's talk about what's going on. Let's sit down. They're the mediator. They're the little therapists. That's their role in the family. They, they see everything. And the sober parent all of a sudden goes, you're the child. We're the adults. We're going to talk about it. You need to go up to your room. This doesn't concern you. And this kid looks at you like you have 14,000 heads and they go, are you fucking kidding me? I just sat here last week while you were drunk and helped dad figure out how we were going to stop you from driving the car to go get more alcohol down at the store. So if I don't solve adult problems, I don't know what planet I'm on. So you have to, as a parent in recovery, and as a family in recovery, be very respectful of your children's journey and insightful as to what they're thinking and experiencing. And again, if you need help knowing that, ask them, damn, there's a revelation. How do you feel about this? How are you think, you know, what do you think is happening right now? How are you feeling about my interaction with you? Is there anything you want me to do less of, more of? Uh, do you want to share anything with me? And most of the time, adult, kids of alcoholics are like, I'm fine. That's the adult kids of an alcoholics. You know, there's shirts on sale right now on the TikTok shop that has blood splattered with it. And it says, I'm fine. That is an adult child of an alcoholic. That's where that came from. I'm fine. Okay. That is an adult child of an alcoholic shirt if I ever saw one. So they're going to say, I'm fine until they trust you long enough to know it's safe to tell you they're not fine. And that might not even be you that they feel safe telling. That's why it's important that you get your children support. Just because you're sober doesn't mean they're not fucking damaged. Just because you're sober now doesn't mean they're not scarred. There is shrapnel from that behavior. And I'm not telling you this to make you feel bad. Oh, great. What? And I'm going to tell you what right now, if I have a person when I'm saying this that goes, oh, great, Heidi, then what did I get sober for? Great, Heidi. Now you're telling me I scarred my kids. Why did I even bother? Great, Heidi. Now I want to drink. You have a long way to go if that is what you're thinking right now. If that is what you're thinking, you have not even started recovery. What you need to be thinking is, oh shit, she's right. I've impacted my children. Let me get in there. If you're thinking that, then honey, you're almost there. Congratulations. But if there's anything that I'm saying to you that is, well, I cannot talk to my kids. They're gonna, they're gonna trigger me up. Well, then you need to, you need to double down on what you're doing. You need to double your dose. You need to see the therapist a little more. You need to go to a couple more meetings a day and get your head on straight. Okay. Okay. The last thing I want to talk about is one of the things that's the most surprising thing for people. I don't know why I'm doing this with my face, but it is the most surprising thing for people on the planet. They never see it coming. They're like, you've got to be kidding me. And if I could prevent one person from experiencing this shock, then I then it's worth it. It's worth talking about it. Are you ready? I'm going to tell you. This is crazy, but it happens. Sometimes people go into treatment and you have been with this person, you're ride or die. You are ride or die. You might even be high school sweethearts with this person. You have been through some shit. You guys started from the bottom. Now you're here. Okay. You have been through so much together. You finally get them into treatment because you finally had, you had enough. You, you finally like pulled the, pulled the trigger. You're like, you got to do this. You held the feet to the fire. They get in there and they have what's called a rehab romance. Now I wish that I could tell you that rehab romance was not real and it wasn't a thing, but I'm going to tell you it is a huge thing, huge thing. I'll tell you what happens. People get into treatment and they meet another human being that's as damaged as they are or wounded. It's been through a war buddy. Okay. That has seen all the things, heard all the people, burned all the bridges, done all the things. They link up with that person. They think, oh my God, 
This is the addict's mind in rehab. Nobody gets me like you do. Nobody understands me like you do. Nobody can possibly see what I'm going through. I, no wonder I've been an alcoholic or addict my whole life. I've been missing you. You are my soulmate. Now, before I really get into this too deeply, I've had, because I worked in treatment before I, now I'm an independent person, a strategic consultant on my own. I did work in treatment and I've had many couples throughout the years in treatment come to me and say, Heidi, this is going to be the one time I'm going to prove you wrong. We're meant to be. Never has that happened when somebody was already married. Okay. I have, unfortunately, I had one beautiful couple that had made it and was, a, they were both single when they met in, in rehab. Okay. And even though I advised against it, they, they went through with it and they continued on the path and they had a beautiful life together and they had two wonderful children together. And unfortunately he passed. Okay. Another situation where this, uh, one of my like adopted daughters, like surrogate daughter got into a relationship with somebody. And I'm like, we're, you know, thinking this is never going to work. They are better for each other. So she, she helps him. She keeps him, you know, grounded and they are better together. And that is just like that movie. He's just not in, that into you. These are the exceptions to the rule. There are some people that meet in treatment that do become couples and that's great. Okay. And I, before you write me and tell me your love story and how you've conquered and mastered the universe, I just want to say, congratulations. That's great. Were you married when you found each other? Because that's what I'm talking about right now. The people are, think they're married and the only problem in their marriage is addiction. Their loved one goes into treatment and this person meets somebody in treatment, falls in love and leaves them in treatment. And you might be thinking to yourself, that is the craziest thing I've ever heard. Well, it happens. And you're thinking how I'm, I'm this, and you're wonderful, right? You're beautiful. You're gorgeous. You're awesome. And you're like, you're successful. You're all the things. And you're like, and this person is homeless, toothless, has no life. You know, the list goes on and on of all the things you could possibly think about this person. Why are they choosing that person over me? Why do they get to treatment and all of a sudden they're going to be sober, but now they're going to be sober and start a new life with this person they met in treatment and they're going to leave me hanging with the kids and everything else. And now they're going to go on their merry way and they're going to live a happy life with somebody else. It's not going to be a happy life. I'm going to tell you that right now. How do I know that? How it started. It started because this is a person that is a coward that ended their relationship by meeting another person and sending you a text or calling you and telling you it's over from treatment. I fell in love or just not coming home. That is a person who is not on the road to recovery. That is a person who is still very sick mentally. That is a person who is still very hurtful. They are not going to have some kind of happy, imaginary, stand up, mor you know, morality-driven existence. The right thing is not going to happen for that person because they started doing the wrong thing to begin with. Okay. So just rest assured, but I want to warn you that does happen. So if you're thinking to yourself, well, I can't send them to a co-ed treatment center. I need them all female. All that. You know, listen, a person is going to find a way to continue to cheat, lie, steal, manipulate if they're committed to that path. And a person is going to find a way to be better, do better, live better, recover if they're committed to that path. And it's really a matter of that. It's a, really a matter at the end of the day of what path am I committed to? Path of self-destruction, that's a never-ending path or a path of recovery for myself and our entire family. I want that to be the path for you. Uh -huh. I sure do. That's why I come on here. That's why I make these videos and record this podcast for you. Is that so we have these talks so that you, number one, you know you're not so alone. Other people are experiencing things just like this. Number two, you know, there is hope. There is absolutely a place you can go to talk about your feelings, get expert guidance and assistance to have somebody like myself. Who I'd love to help you personally. You can purchase the family course over at HeidiRain.com and start learning as a family together and dedicate, you know, a family night, God forbid, what would that be like if we had a family night just dedicated to recovery, where we all come together and talk about how we can be better as a family and what we need and want from one another. Wouldn't that be an amazing thing? Can we restore that type of relationship dynamic to our family? If I can inspire that in you by helping you get started with a course or having me come alongside of you in a family meeting 
and talking with the whole family and getting a vibe and a feeling, or if you want me, you want to fly me to your family and you want me to come to your house and you want me to sit with you guys. And we want to do like a family intervention for a period of a week where we come and I stay and I get with you and we talk about it. And I meet with each of your children and each of your family members. And we get a rock solid family program planned down for you and your entire family. Anything can be done. Anything can happen. Uh, when you're committed to it. Okay. All right. I love you so much. I hope this has been helpful. Take excellent care of yourself and your family. And I'll see you again in another episode or uh, live and in person. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye.